What is up my dudes? Today we're going to talk about Chapter 4 Network Access. And we'll be talking about some of this stuff, and some of that stuff, and then let's get into it, the physical layer protocols. Alright, so before uh, network communications can occur, a physical connection to a local network must be established. So here we have like a home router. You know, this is where the power goes in, this is the plug that goes into the Ethernet, so this is a routed port. Uh, and then these are your switch ports that your PCs would plug into. So there has to be some kind of physical connection. Even if you're wireless, there has to be a physical connection. I remember like 15, maybe even 20 years ago, um, one of the hospital systems I was at, the, hosp the, the big hospital was going wireless. And when they saw the quote, they're like, what's all this money for wired? I thought we were going wireless. So I guess they didn't realize that even the wireless access points all need to have a physical connection you know, to the network. So all that uh, data cabling has to be wired up in the ceiling. All right, moving on. So, your device will have some kind of network interface card that we typically refer to as a NIC. And the NIC can be, it can be a fiber card, it can be a, a coax uh, card, um, although the majority of them are Ethernet cards. Uh, and then this is your little, little Ethernet plug that goes in there. Or you might have a built-in wireless card. And the wireless cards can be full-size cards or they can just be little USB adapters that kind of plug in. So, any device on the network needs some kind of NIC card. Um, whether it be a printer, um, a, a wireless client, a tablet PC, a laptop, or a PC. All right, so again, here we are with the OSI model. And this week, we're really concerned with the bottom two layers, the physical and the data link layer. You know, the data link will encode the frames um, based on the physical needs, whether it's going to be sent as electricity, as pulses of light, or radio waves. Because different standards have different sized um, requirements. You know, the maximum transmission unit, or the maximum MTU size for Ethernet, um, is 1,518, but we usually set that to 1,500. So, however it is we're encoding things at the data link layer, we pass it down to the physical layer, and then its job is to send it into ones and zeros. So everything um, gets converted down to its very basic ones and zeros to be transmitted. So I might send a pulse of electricity for a 1, or no pulse of electricity during the time frame um, in order to signal a 0. Or I may signal or do a long pulse of electricity in a sh for a 1, and a short post pul uh, pulse of electricity for a 0. And in another week or two, we'll talk about binary and ASCII, and, um, and we'll show you how we convert the you know, numbers and letters um, into 1s and zeros. All right, moving on. So, like we've talked about, there are three basic forms of network media. There's electrical cable or copper cable, there's a fiber optic cable that does pulses of light, uh, and then there's wireless that sends, you know, uh, radio signals through the air. So, depending on what you're using, uh, there may be different standards or different standard organizations that apply to that. You know, obviously the FCC you know, is very concerned about wireless, but they're not really concerned about wired communication, you know, through coax cable or ethernet cable. All right, and then there's a lab about identifying devices, and we'll actually cover this the, the packet tracer lab in this at the end of the video. All right, and then your book gets into these different encoding methods, and I don't really under, ever understood why. Like, I've never needed to know this um, in 20 years of networking. So when we're talking about encoding, um, there are different ways to send the bits, uh, different modulation techniques. So am I reading the bit at the top, or am I reading the bit at the middle, or am I reading the bit at the bottom or the end? So let's assume these are just different time segments, time segment 1, time segment 2, time segment 3. When do I read the number? So in this case, they're actually reading it at the middle section of the time frame. So at the time frame, if it's below this line, it's a 0, and if it's above this line, it's a 1. So below, 0, 1, 0, and then 0. Uh, and it always goes back to 1 to reset. Right, they also mention modulation um, and carrier signals, which we really kind of get into more in the wireless chapter. So let's move on. All right, bandwidth. You'll need to know your bandwidth. There are bits per second, kilobits per second, megabits, gigabits, and terabits. So a bit, obviously, is a 1 or a 0. And a kilobit is 1,000 bits. And a megabit is a million bits. And a gigabit is... Ooh, I'm sorry. A billion bits. And then a terabit is a... Trillion bits. Now, and that's just for reference purposes. Actually, a kilobit is like 10 uh, is 1,024 bits, 
Um, so you may see some different numbers depending on whether they're just doing kind of giving you a baseline like this is or if they're actually being accurate. And I don't know why it's 1024. Um, it has something to do with uh, the way that it's created. Uh, but moving on. So throughput for a device is, is the measure of how many bits across the medium over a given amount of time. So when you buy um, cable internet from your provider, you'll get a download speed and an upload speed. And there are a lot of things that depend on that traffic. Like depending on where you're testing, a lot of people, like I, uh, I'm in Southern Ohio, so um, some people here in Southern Ohio will actually test to a server in Texas. But that doesn't really make any sense because my provider doesn't own you know, the entire path you know, from Ohio to Texas. So I'm going to hit some other providers' paths as well. And there could be other traffic. There could be big things going on. So you might not see exactly what you're promised you know, from your provider all the time depending on where you test and how you test. All right, they also talk about good put. Now, good put is throughput minus the overhead, you know, all the headers and the other communication that happens on the network. So how much actual data gets through there? And while that's nice to know, you'll never see that listed anywhere. Like anytime you go to a device um, to buy it from CDW or, you know, Ingram Micro or something like that, good put is never listed as, you know, one of the specifications. It's always throughput. All right, moving on. So... Um, there are different s models and sizes of routers. So this is the kind of like the low end, the 1941 router, and this is the back of it. So the back of it has a bunch of fast Ethernet ports. Um, it has management ports that we can manage things on, um, and it has a NIC card um, that operates at gigabit speeds. Um, and then there are also ports to plug into um, for our physical cable or USB cable, so we can do commands on it. Now we'll talk a lot about these ports and stuff in. Um, Crap, what you, in phase two or the the second class but I just want to make sure you're, you're clear that this gigabit port here this the yellow port usually there's two depending on your router so obviously as you get bigger from this series and you go into the next size up you will always get two gigabit ports or, or at least two yellow ports fast Ethernet 00 and fast Ethernet 01 and these are just NIC cards on the router um, to plug into a you know like your main switch and stuff um, to connect the, the internal network and that's going to come into play in the lab when we get there. So uh, I'll bring this back up again when we talk about the lab. All right, network media. Dun, dun, dun. All right, so first we talk about copper because copper is the most common type. And I'm not talking about the coax cable, but I'm talking about the copper Ethernet cable. So it uses pulse electricity. And attenuation means that the longer the electricity travels down that path, the more it deteriorates. So the rule of thumb is um, you can never have a cable longer than 100 meters. Because after 100 meters, the signal kind of uh, deteriorates so bad that you theoretically won't be able to use it at that point. Now, that 100 meters is kind of a, uh, a ballpark figure. You might have a cable that runs 110 meters and works fine, and then the next day you have a cable that's 90 meters and doesn't run fine. So anytime you get close to 100 meters, you got to pop something else in there to repeat and strengthen the signal, um, be it a hub, a, a switch, or something like that. Uh, and copper cable is also very prone to electromagnetic interference or radio frequency interference that's generated by um, uh, motors and industrial equipment like that. Um, give an example, again, years ago um, we had a, a cable company come in and run some cable for us and one cable they ran, they actually wrapped it around, not wrapped it around, but it actually kind of did a bend around the motor for the elevator. And this user, like after everything was installed, they tested, everything was fine, of course they tested at night while they're working because nobody was in there. And then the next day, when the user's working, she has random times where her uh, her connectivity just goes. And we really had a hard time kind of figuring out because we go down to the PC and we're like, hey, um, cable tests fine, um, everything's great. Um, PC tests fine, everything's awesome. And then all of a sudden, boom, somebody would use the elevator um, and it would have some issues. Um, and then the, the, she'd get this interference. Uh, but it was only for a couple seconds. So later on, we actually traced the cable and found that instead of using the cable guides, um, this must have been maybe the last cable the guy ran or something was in a hurry. So he actually um, went around and, and kind of touched the, um, the motor on the outside of it um, in a 90 degree angle, which was just terrible. So we had him come out, run a new cable, uh, and then everything was fine. So to counter that, you can get um, copper cable that's actually wrapped in shielding inside the cable. Now there's another issue called crosstalk, and that's caused by electrical or magnetic fields of a signal of one wire jumping to an adjacent wire. 
Um, and now to, to eliminate that, what they do is they put these pairs and they twist them together. So that's why copper cable is now kind of known as twisted pair. So you'll see these pairs and the pairs are all twisted together. Here's some shielding, like in case you have to go near some industrial equipment to stop the electromagnetic interference. But you get the idea. So unshielded twisted pair is the most common. So there are eight wires in there and they're paired up into like a solid color and then a white and solid. So this is blue, blue, white, orange, orange, white, green, green, white, brown, brown, white. Uh, and they're always colored that uh, unless they're a really cheap off brand. Then you can get shielded twisted pair, again with the shield inside, or you can get coax cable. Now I don't know anybody that's using coax cable nowadays uh, unless you're talking about cable TV. But the main takeaway is um, we twist these pairs to avoid crosstalk. And Ethernet cable that we use with this twisted pair uses an RJ45 connector. So that little clear thing that plugs into the PC that has like a little lock mechanism on it, that is an RJ45, and RJ stands for registered jack. Now at the college, when I teach this section, we always actually we make cables in class. Sadly, we won't be doing that, so eventually I'll link you guys to a good cable making video. All right, and then there's shielded twisted pair. There's some kind of shielding in there, um, you know, to uh, stop that uh, radio radio frequency interference or electromagnetic interference. But it still has eight wires, and those wires are in pairs. All right, then there's coax cable. Boo! We don't use coax cable. All right, so some rules: you should never run data cables and electrical cables down the same path. Um, what will happen is usually the electricians come in first, um, and they're union guys, so they typically do a very good job of, of running electrical cables. So they put the right the cable guides in or cable trays, and they run their power cables. Then the, the data cable guy comes in, and he doesn't give a rat's a behind. All he has to do is make sure that cable works one time, and he's done. So he'll throw those cables right in the same racks as, as um, electrical wiring. Um, and when you go between buildings or through, um, sometimes even between rooms, if the cinder blocks but dividing rooms up goes all the way to the ceiling, they'll put like a conduit in there um, to run cables. And they'll run their data cables through that same conduit as uh, power cables. Then anytime there's power, you might have issues with the data cables. So you really have to pay attention and make sure that you are picking the right cable guy if you're not running cables internally. All right, you want to make sure that your cable and closets are wired correctly, that you uh, the, the little locks aren't busted off on these pins so that they come off. And you can really have some serious mess in cable closets. Let me show you some pics. Uh, here's one. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And you see stuff like this all the time. And the reason it's like this is because they have people change cables whenever they move a user. So, for example, you know, I'm going to use a, uh, I'm going to move a user from sales to marketing, or from the first floor of marketing to the third floor of marketing, something like that. So what the, the IT guy goes in and he undoes the PC and gets everything put on a cart. Then he records the jack number. And then he goes and he goes upstairs and he puts her in their new place and records the jack number. Then he comes in the closet and he moves her from one jack to another in the closet. But her old position may have required a 12-foot cable to go from where it needed to go into the switch. But her new position only needs like a 2-foot cable. So instead of just making a new cable, he'll just use the 12-foot cable. Then you start getting this spaghetti mess. Now the way it should work is like this, where you're not moving cables. There's no need to move cables. Every cable should be plugged in every jack, and then the network guy should be using um, some kind of web interface for the switch and just turn ports on and turn ports off. And that way you're all set and there's no need to ever move a cable so you won't have these cluster messes. Now you might think, oh, what's the big deal of, of big messy cables? Well, one, obviously there's issues like when I go to move a cable, I might bump other cables and break things and or trip and fall and knock the whole rack down. But it also prevents airflow. Most networking equipment sucks air in from the front and blows out the back, just like a PC. So how much airflow am I getting at this point right here? A uh, pretty small amount. So we want you know nice, cool stuff wired, all cables in the ceiling with nice cable trays, um, which would be awesome. Sadly, that's not the way it works. Um, we, we see clusters like this all the time. All right, I digress. Move. And then you want to make sure that you're, you've checked your case, especially after any new installation. You make sure you get up in the ceiling and check to see what they did. Uh, and then you want to make sure that your stuff is grounded. All right, so again, um, our twisted, our unshielded twisted pair, which is the most common, is eight cables, and each cable is a pair. So orange, orange, white, blue, blue, white, green, green, white, brown, brown, white. 
So we've got no shielding, so EMI or RFI could um, uh, cause issues. But again, you know, if you're like in a hospital system or just a regular business and you don't have, you know, industrial machinery, you know, running, then you're usually you're okay. All right, so Ethernet cable is is um, sold or provided by in categories. So category three cable um, uh, is is 10 megabits per second. Category 5 cable is 100 megabits per second, and category 6 cable is 1,000 megabits per second. So what you'll find, is, especially like in older companies that have been in the buildings for years and years, uh, maybe two decades, uh, a lot of times PCs are still connected using uh, category 3 cable. Um, I've even seen Cat 3 used for phone systems and stuff like that. Um, but at this point in time, like any company that you're working on should have at least Cat 5 uh, or Cat 5 enhanced, um, and Cat 6 if it's awesome. But usually Cat5 does the job today. You know, like, what's your what's your normal internet speed for a business? Um, is it 100 megabits, you know, download and upload speed? No, then you probably are okay with, you know, having a lower speed cable like a Cat5 cable. But you never want a Cat3 cable. All right, there's Cat5 and Cat5e. Cat5e is enhanced. Um, and it's you'll see a bunch of different speeds. Like, Cat5e supports up to um, 1,000 megabits per second. And I've seen other places say, well, Cat5e goes up to 200 megabits per second. So it all depends. And there's never any actual standard for Cat5e cable, just that it's an enhanced form of Cat5 cable, and supposedly it, it transmits at a higher speed. Um, but if you want 1,000 megabit, get Category 6, just to make sure. Um, the Category 6 cable, when you actually feel it in your hand compared to the Cat5 cable, the copper is actually thicker in the Cat6 cable. Um, so, and then another thing to think about, you need the correct cable ends for the correct cable. If you try to jam Cat6 cable into Cat5 cable ends, sometimes the copper is too thick and you can't get it through the little slots. Other times you could have issues where your Cat5 end only produces a cat at 100 megabits per second. So putting a 1,000 speed cable into a 100 megabit uh, connector obviously is a bad idea. All right, so then they talk about these, these cables. So this is an RJ45 connector. Um, in a lot of places, companies you know, like make their own cables. All right, and then this is a little wall jack, and these, you can see how these wall jacks are marked. Um, so they have the orange, blue, um, brown, and green, so we can plug in the, the, the different pairs. And then an RJ45 jack you know, has these eight connectors, and then it also has this little piece here that actually crimps down on the casing of the cable. So if you, if you have too much cable sticking out and not enough casing going into the thing and it doesn't go all the way here, when you crimp it down, it actually won't stay and you'll have issues with that cable big time. So make sure that when you crimp a cable down, um, it looks like this and this little bar here um, hits actual casing and not just wires like this. All right, so there are a lot of different videos out there that show you how to do cabling and how to you know put the ends on and crimp them down. The, the crimp tool is like only like 12 bucks. Um, for a cheap one, uh, and you can obviously get a more. If you're going to be in networking, you want to buy better tools. Uh, so I'll move on. All right. So the RJ45. If we look at so the, here's where the clip would be. And there are standards for the wire, and this is why when you buy um, twisted pair, um, it always has these same colors so that you can wire them according to the standard. Now the straight through cable has two 568B ends. Now, it can also have two 568A ends, but the ends have to match. If you have an A on the one side, you need an A on the other side. If you have a B on one side, you have a B on the other side. And that's a straight through. And if you look, you'll notice just the green and orange are flip-flopped between the two. So if I was going to make a, a crossover cable to connect my PC to my son's PC, um, I would need a crossover cable. So one of the ends needs to be crossed. And the reason it needs to be crossed is, um, let's assume that, that the orange wire is the send and the green wires are the receive, because it only uses four, four wires um, in the cable. So if, I, if, my send goes to my, if my send goes to your send, I'll never receive anything. So my send needs to get crossed over to your receive, uh, which would be here. So we typically send in one and two, and we receive in three and six. So one, two, three, and six are the only cables that actually send data. The other ones are for other stuff that we'll talk about later. So to produce a crossover cable, we simply take one end and we switch one and three, and then two and six. All right, a straight through, anytime we go from any kind of device into a switch, we can use a straight through cable. Anytime you go from two similar devices, like a NIC card to a NIC card, you need to use a crossover cable. So this is what I was talking about. Like on the CCNA, this question is actually there. It's, it's a, a drag and drop. 
and they are saying PC to router is a straight through cable. But I'll show you in the lab today, that is not the case. You can't go from a NIC card to another NIC card with a straight through cable because my send will hit your send and my receive will hit your receive and they'll never work. But the actual correct answer is straight through on the CCNA exam. Why it's like that, I have no idea. Well, I honestly think it has something to do with people at Cisco smoking crack, but I'll digress. All right, then there's the, the rollover cable. And the rollover cable is like a light blue, uh, very thin kind of flat cable um, that comes with most Cisco devices so that you can plug into your PC's um, serial port and then into the console port of a router. And again, we'll get into more of that when we get into the, uh, the second class. All right, there are all kinds of devices for testing UTP cables, um, especially if you're making your own. You want to make sure that they, they work correctly. Um, and there are some that actually track cable length. There are some that will track cable loss. Um, oh, crap. What's that name of the company? Oh, it's Fluke. Fluke makes some of the most awesome cable tools, uh, cable testing tools, but they're crazy expensive. So if you got some time, go to YouTube and look up um, Fluke Network Cable Testers, um, and you'll see um, all the different ones they have out there and how expensive they are. All right, so then there's a, a, a lab here, da, 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 da. and then we talk about fiber cabling. Now, fiber cabling is really nice. In most places, well, I don't say most places, but like in my area where I'm at now, we actually have fiber all the way to the house. So uh, t uh, Spectrum um, actually does fiber all the way to my house, and then it goes to a little adapter, then some coax from there into the house um, and into the cable motor. But fiber um, is co completely immune to um, electromagnetic interference and radio frequency interference. And fiber will go longer distances. Like there are some fiber cables that go, you know, miles and miles, uh, uh, you know, before they start losing signal strength. All right, so here's what the inside of fiber looks like. Um, inside you've got a, a small glass core. Then you have this cladding around it. And the cladding is actually kind of like a mirror to keep the light pulses inside there. Uh, and then you have some kind of buffer. Uh, then you have a strengthening material. And then you have the jacket on the outside. The problem is with fiber cables, um, you need a, a very specialized kit to be able to create those ends because it actually melts and burns the ends um, on, onto them. Um, I had a guy who came in from class, and he actually worked for a company. And he, they actually had a fiber burning kit, um, and it was from Owens Corning, and it was like a $1,000 kit. It was really nice, and he showed us some, um, some making some cables. So, again, a little bit more expensive to use fiber. Obviously, the cable is more expensive. You have to be careful because of that glass core. If you bend the cable 90 degrees, you can actually crack that, that glass core, uh, then you're going to have issues. So you have to be very careful laying it, and especially even storing it. All right, they have single mode and multi mode fiber. In single mode fiber, the glass core is only nine microns in size, which is really pretty tiny, and it only sends one signal. Now, in multi mode, the the glass core can be all the way up to 50 to 62 microns, which obviously is way bigger, and it allows multiple signals to bounce uh, their way through there. So single mode can go farther because it uses laser as the light source, uh, and then multi mode uses LEDs. Um, so that cable, the multi mode cable, doesn't go as far. Um, like I think single mode can go, you know, so like 10 miles. Uh, multi mode fiber is like 1.2 miles or something like that. All right, and then there's all kinds of different fiber optic ends. So typically, what you see is stuff like like uh, this one here or this. Like we don't typically see this anymore. Now, when I took the CCNA in summer of 2018, uh, they had nothing like this on the CCNA. There was nothing about fiber connectors. So don't worry too much about those. Um, but just if you see something like this, just know that that's fiber. All right, and then this is typically the way we store fiber, like in a roll like this, because we don't want to bend it 90 degrees. Anytime you have a sharp bend, again, it cracks the glass. So uh, yellow jackets for single mode, um, oranges for uh, multi mode. And you should put some kind of cap on these ends if it's not being used because um, you don't want dust or to, for it to scratch against something. You know, when you're dragging across a desk or something, uh, you'll cause little scr micro scratches in there or micro tears, whatever they call them. All right, and then again, the fiber testing stuff. Um, again, Fluke makes some awesome stuff. Um, but again, that stuff is crazy expensive. So most companies might have fiber run um, from like one building to another, um, but then it's, it's converted somewhere with a... Um, uh, a dongle or something um, that then puts it into uh, Ethernet and kind of plugs in or something like that. So most uh, networking guys aren't really running fiber unless you work for uh, a cabling company. So with UTP cable, you know, 10 gigs is our max, about our max speed, where um, 100 gigs per fiber cable um, is our max speed for fiber. Um, distance, I can go, you know, 10,000 meters, uh, which is nice. 
Um, I'm completely immune to everything, but I have the highest cost and the highest skills required and the highest cost for equipment and stuff and the highest amount of precautions. So again, we typically want to do that like if we're wiring one building to another, they're right beside each other or something like that. Um, like my, I worked at a facility where we had a, a new wing was added and we added fiber to the new wing um, and then it got handed off into the switch uh, and then the switch was copper from there on. Alright, then there's all kinds of wireless meat. And when you're doing wireless, there's all kinds of different things you have to think about. Um, the coverage area, um, what's in the buildings. And a lot of times, like you see these little mini malls, and you know, some new company takes over and they, they want you to install wireless, and you install wireless, and they have all kinds of problems in one room. They're like, I can't get anything in. And it turns out there was a doctor's office or a dentist's office that was in there previously, and they had lead lined walls because they had an x ray machine. So you have to think about all this stuff. We also found that like large stacks of paper. Um, can interfere with wireless. Like we had a medical records room and the whole wall was just cabinets of medical records. So we had a hard time getting a wireless signal through that so we ended up having to put an access point inside there as well. And then obviously security. With wireless, somebody can be a mile away and can be pointing a cantenna at your network um, and actually intercept those packets. Um, so you have to be careful about it. So there's a lot of different considerations. Eventually we have a chapter on wireless where we'll talk about basic wireless. There's also a CCNA wireless uh, class uh, that really kind of gets into the, the, the intricacies of wireless. Um, because there are guys and they actually specialize just in wireless because it's so complicated. Alright, so wireless media is 802.11 and then there's 802.11a, b, uh, g, n, a, b, a, c, a bunch of other stuff. All right, Bluetooth is 802.15 and WiMAX is 802.16. So Bluetooth is like your personal area network, you know, obviously your keyboards and your mice, things like that, little headsets. And then WiMAX, basically what happens is people rent space on cell towers and things like that, and they get, um, they may buy some bandwidth from a local ISP, and then they sell um, wireless bandwidth to all the people that are in that coverage area. All right, so again, we have to have some kind of wireless access point to kind of send that signal out. Um, then you need to have a wireless NIC card to receive that. So anybody you guys that have Roku devices or things like that, um, those have you know wireless NIC adapters built inside them. All right, then there's lab. We'll be going through this lab at the end of this video. Um, it's just showing different wires to connect. And there's some stuff about viewing stuff, and then we get into the data link protocols. So oh, got a little too fast. So the data link layer prepares data for the network. So it, it will format those frames depending on what media you're going to send it on. So remember we talked about like different media allows different packet sizes, things like that. It also adds the layer to um, what they call the data link address. Now Cisco typically refers this as the MAC address and Microsoft refers this as a physical address and it's a 12 digit hexadecimal number. The first six digits show the manufacturer and the second six are typically used as like a serial number. And that way, like let's say you decided, hey, I'm gonna go make, uh, I'm gonna make, start a new company and we're gonna make uh, NIC cards. Well, you need to talk to one of the internet's uh, standard organizations and they will assign you your first six digits um, for your MAC address. Then every NIC card you make has to start with those six digits in the MAC address. Then you can use the other six digits for whatever you want. So local traffic, like if I just go from me you know, in my classroom to another person in the classroom, um, it all goes by uh, MAC address. All right, the data link layer is actually divided into two different sections, the LLC layer and then the, the media access control or the MAC layer. So the MAC layer obviously assigns the, the MAC address uh, and then I have the layer, the LLC, um, that kind of handles the control. All right, then there are other like satellites Satellite can be good if you're in a very rural area, um, but if you need real-time connectivity to like a SQL server or something like that for a business, a satellite is not the answer. But think about it, like any time I do a speed test um, of my network, I have to really consider where I'm sending that speed test to, where I'm testing you know, from my house to where. Because if I'm going from Ohio to, Ch to Chicago, Illinois, I may hit three or four different provider networks. Um, and I can't, you know, a provider can't necessarily guarantee um, speed, you know, from, let's say, New York to California. Different providers make different deals with their neighboring providers, but then those neighboring providers might have different deals with their neighboring providers and so on and so forth. So you can never really kind of guarantee speed outside of a provider's network. And if you look in the fine print, that's typically what you'll see. All right, so then, what the, there we go. Oh, sorry, freaking out here. 
All right, that's the slide I want to be. So when you send your stuff out to the internet, you know, it hits your router, and your router um, then decapsulates the frame, takes off the layer two stuff, decides where it needs to go, like where the next hop is, and then it re-encapsulates and puts a new MAC address on there for the local loop. And it hits the next router, the next router pulls off the layer two stuff, decides where it's going to go, where the next hop is, puts new uh, MAC address and information on there, and then forwards it out to the local loop. All right, again, then there's standard organizations. Yay! Then there's media access control. All right, we're almost done here. So when we talk about media access control, we're talking about the rules. You know, what's the rules for talking? Who can talk when they can talk? All right, then there's physical and logical, which these are almost the exact same pictures. Um, but remember, physical is the actual devices um, all the way through your network or, or through the data path that you're looking at. And then logical is how does data move? You know, what does data go through um, uh, as it gets from point A to point B? All right, there are different um, WAN topologies. Um, there's point to point when we go from one building to another. Um, there's hub and spoke, like inside a building, inside a room, we might all go plug into a switch in a classroom. Then there's full mesh where everybody has inner connectivity to everybody else. So if one line goes down, uh, the network still works and nobody goes down. Now you'll very, very seldom do you see full mesh networks because they're very expensive. Um, if you think about these, let's assume that each of these is a server. So each server would need one, two, three, four, five NIC cards in it. Uh, and that's a little bit excessive. All right, so a physical point-to-point -point network might be, let's say you own a building or you own a business, and you buy a new business six miles down the road. And that new business is going to connect to you. And they're going to you know, use your, your file services and email and stuff like that. So they need some kind of connection to your main building. So what then we do is we build a point-to-point. -point. You might talk to an ISP and get a T1 put in for them. Um, which is a private piece of copper, or you might just get them internet and then create a VPN point to point, you know, in from to the headquarters office so they can connect that way. All right, and then you have the logical point to point, blah. More of that. All right, so most of the networks we see today are star networks. So, and the, the stars, like this, there would be a switch in the middle, all the PCs would connect to the switch. And then you have switches that connect to other, other switches, so you have the extended star. They also talk about bus. Years and years ago, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, they would have a truck pull up to a business with a giant spool of cable, coax cable in there, and they would run that co that one single coax cable um, and snake it through the entire building. So it was, and they terminated both ends, and then everything ran on that one cable, and it was miserable. And now, and so that has gone the way of the dinosaurs. We don't have bus networks anymore. And have it for decades. Uh, and then I have ring, and think about token ring. So, and when I think about token ring, like the last token ring I ever saw was like back in 1990s, um, a bajillion years ago. But there's some kind of method where there's like a, let's say the magic conch, and it floats around here. And then when this PC wants to talk, he has to wait for the conch to come, and the conch has to be empty. Then he puts his traffic on there, and then it goes to where it needs to go and drops off. So you have to wait for that little thing to come around the token to put your stuff on there so again very ineffective terrible nowadays everything is star or extended star all right then they have full and half duplex so half duplex is like a walkie-talkie if you remember when you were younger and you had a set of walkie-talkies and your brother would always press the button and, and say you know you're a mushy face doo-doo head and you couldn't say anything back until he released his button that's half duplex i can send and receive but i can only do one at a time now full duplex I can send and receive at the same time. So full duplex is like a phone call. You know, you can call me whatever names you want, and I can scream at you at the same time, and we can hear and send at the same time. So half duplex, I can either send or receive. Full duplex, I can send and receive at the same time. Now, because of this, with half duplex, we have to worry about collisions which means if you're sending to me at the same time I'm trying to send a packet, those packets may collide and hit each other. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So in half duplex networks, um, all the nodes are competing, you know, for use of the media or media. Now, by default, when you first plug any device into a switch port, a Cisco switch, um, Cisco will try to negotiate full duplex. But if for some reason that negotiation fails, um, it will revert to half duplex. And so you'll need to make sure that you check that. And again, we'll talk a lot about that when we get into the second chapter or the second class, um, routing and switching essentials. All right, and then the uh, token ring. We're not talking about token ring. Let's escape. All right, so then there's carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. So this is how our Ethernet works. It works on a system called CSMACD, carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. And what that means is when my PC wants to talk, 
he'll go to the carrier, the, the media, and he'll sense if there's any kind of traffic coming. If there's no traffic coming, then he'll send something, or try to send. And if something hits it, if something, well, if I send something out and something else comes in and hits me at the exact same time, we have what they call a collision. And what happens is both sides back off, like both packets are sent back to their source so that they know there's a collision. Both of them wait a random amount of time, and then they try the whole process again. Now, multiple multiple access just means um, we're not the only PC on the network. You know, there are other PCs on this uh, connect that we can connect to. So that's what carrier sense multiple access with collision detection means. I'll listen to the media. If it's free, I'll send. Um, if there's a collision and my packet comes back, I'll wait a random amount of time and then I'll, I'll start the whole process again. So you can see collisions are bad because they stop packets from going and they cause that random wait uh, to occur before I can send again. Now, wireless fixes this because wireless has no way of handling collisions. So wireless does CSMA collision avoidance. And what it does is it's kind of like in that magic conch thing. Um, you have to send request to sends and clear to sends uh, in order to talk on a wireless. So wireless is actually time sharing. And a lot of people don't realize this. So what happens is when this client wants to talk, he sends a request to send an RTS. And then whenever it's his turn, the wireless access point then sends him a clear to send. It says, okay, you're clear to send for 12, megas 12 milliseconds. Then the next guy, and he sends that stuff out. So all that is controlled. So only one person's talking at a time. So it's time sharing. And again, what the problem is, you know, even if you're at 54 uh, megabits per second, your full, you know, uh, 802.11g speed, and you're sh and at home, you've got, you know, two or three iPads, uh, you got a Roku, uh, and then your wife, you know, streaming, you know, the the Real Housewives of Orange County. Your kids are watching cartoons on the Roku. Your wireless may really suck because you're time sharing with those two other devices um, that are getting a a lot of data. You know, video is very intensive, so there's a lot of data in video. So you're time sharing with that. So even though your Xbox may say connected at you know 54 megabits per second, that, that still doesn't mean that you're not time sharing with everybody else that's on that wireless access point. And if your neighbors are any good with with networking, they're probably uh, stealing your your wireless anyway. Uh, so then you got to deal with that. All right, and then we come down to you know the the, the basic you know what is actually sent um, back and forth, and we send frames. You know the frames are actually formatted into ones and zeros, and we send a frame at a time. So we're sending ones and zeros. Here's the first frame. Stop. Here's the next frame. Da da da. So each frame has a header. It has data and it has a trailer. The header says, hey, here's what's coming and here's the addressing information. Then I have the data and then I typically have some kind of error correction mechanism uh, or error detection mechanism in the trailer, whether it's a frame check sequence or something like that. So here you can kind of see, so I have the start of the frame, so the preamble is coming and saying, hey, um, this next bit of code is the next frame. Here's some addressing, some types of controls. Here's the data, and then we have some error detection, and then we say, have something to signal, hey, this is the end of the frame. Um, we're all done with this frame. All right, and then here's what I was talking about earlier. So anytime I send something, the IP address, the IP, the source and destination of the IP address never changes, but the source destination MAC address or the layer two address always changes. So as soon as I hit this router, it strips off these NIC addresses and it puts new NIC card information or new MAC address information on the packet. Then it sends to R2. R2 strips this off and then puts new uh, MAC address information on there for the local loop. So make sure you're aware of that. The IP address information never changes through the entire transit. But the layer two information, the MAC address, is only for the local loop. So it needs to be removed and replaced with new information. So your router does that um, automatically. All right, and then when we go across the internet or something like that, there are all kinds of different protocols and stuff we can use. Um, like we can use a wireless to our router. Then I can be sending a, a use, using PPP to connect um, to a router. Then I can be using HDLC to another router and then go through a provider's network, a frame relay. And then I can have Ethernet. So we, that's what's kind of neat about today's networks. You know, we can use any kind of cable, any kind of um, encapsulation uh, in different parts, and it all still works together because it all works on that OSI model. Um, as long as everything follows that model, um, everything will work. Hooray! That's the chapter. All right, normally I do a separate video for the lab because this lab is going to be so short, I'm just going to kind of tack it on here at the bottom of this. All right, so here's the Packet Tracer Lab. So if I scroll down, it'll say, oh, you actually need to move the source so I can see this a little bit. All right, at the bottom left, click the orange lightning arrow. So this is the cabling uh, for pin packet tracer. If I click that, all my cable shows up. Now, this is auto cable, and you auto not use that. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm stealing that from you. 
And then there's the console cable, straight through, crossover cable, fiber, phone, coax, um, serial cable, and the different ends of the serial cable, stuff like that. So all we're going to do is we're just going to cable some stuff. So it says first, um, router 0 on FA00 to cloud um, Ethernet 6. So router 0, FA00 to cloud Ethernet 6. So I'm going to use a straight through for that. So copper straight through. And it said FA00, so fast Ethernet 00. And they go to the cloud and cloud fast Ethernet 6. And as long as it's green, it's good. And I see I got 10 points, so everything's good. All right, and next, okay, now we need to do cloud coax 7 to modem port 0. So cloud to modem, cloud ports coax 7 to the modem. So now I need coax, which was the blue. So cloud, coax 7 to cable modem port 0. And I got green, so that works. And then I get a little points, yay! All right, now, connect router 0 to router 1. So serial 0, 0, 0 to router 0, 0, 0. So I'm going to grab a, a DTE and go from router 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, to router, or from router 0 to router 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Anyway, that's green. Now, here's what I was talking about with that, uh, why Cisco is like on crack. So connect router 0 to Netacad PK. So connect this router to this server. So you can see the router bleh, has a fast Ethernet card. So I'm going to get it straight through, just like Cisco says on their exam. And I'm going to go fast Ethernet. And I'm going to plug into his NIC card. And the lines are green or red because it doesn't work that way. Let me get rid of that. You have to use a crossover cable to go from a fast Ethernet NIC card to a fast Ethernet NIC card. And then it goes green. So I don't get I really struggle with Cisco sometimes and why they do this stuff. All right, so router zero console um, to where? Um, to the configuration term oh, from the terminal. So we go to the console cable, and that is RS-232. It's a serial port into the console port. And that one, you'll just see it like that. Now, nowadays, PCs don't really come with um, uh, console ports. Um, so you can either get a, like a dongle that goes console to USB, um, or you can use the new Cisco um, micro USB to USB cables that all their devices um, have supported for years. All right, and then connect router 1 to the switch. So we'll, now, this is another point where I have issues with, because you can use straight through cables from a switch to a switch or a switch to anything else. But in Cisco, we're like on the CCNA, if they ask you from switch to switch, they're thinking same thing the same thing, it has to be a crossover cable. But we're going from router 1, fast Ethernet 1, 1, 0. So router 1, fast Ethernet. All right, does that say router 1? Fast Ethernet 1, 0. There is no... Oh, there it is. Duh. Oh, is that fiber? Yes, apparently that's a fiber connection. So we need to go to our fiber cable. And you see those two little ports for the, you know, the send and the receive. And then that goes into the switch. Now, again, anytime you connect to a switch, you'll see an amber light because it's trying to learn MAC address and information. All right, uh, modem port one to wireless router internet port. Oh, so from modem to here. So that can be a straight through cable, I'm assuming. Port one to uh, to internet, yes. All right, and then choose the correct cable, wireless router ethernet one to family PC. All right, and that one we can do straight through uh, it said port 1, wireless router, Ethernet 1, to the family PC. And there is no NIC card on there. So there is no cable. Oh, duh, to family PC. Why do you guys not let me do stupid stuff? So Ethernet 1 to family PC. And why the family PC end is amber, I have no idea. It shouldn't be like that. Give it a minute, it'll go green. All right, test the connection from family PC to Netacad. Open the family PC and ping this. All right, let me grab that. Control C. Got to wait for my cable to come up. All right, my cable came up. I go to my PC. Go to desktop, command prompt, and I want to ping. And oh, really? It's not going to type in you little. All right, netacad.pka. 
Oh, well, that didn't work. But let's go to back to desktop. And what does it say? From the web browser, open that. Where's the web browser? There it is. So can I open HTTP colon backslash? Uh, go. Doesn't seem to be going. Uh, am I on the right PC? Duh. Let me see. Yeah, I'm on family PC. So, you can see I got 80 out of 80. I have no idea why that's not working. Um, probably has something to do with our cloud not being configured correctly or something like that. But yay, Cisco. So I would turn that in, get my 8080, and I would be all done. Um, if you want to play around with these other things, you can. And all right, I guess it just took a minute for that to go through, for the, the, the naming stuff to kick in. Because now it works. You can't ping by any, like none of these have IP addresses on there. So again, and this is like the, the big issue with Packet Tracer. It's a sim that they create, and, and their labs only work a certain way. Um, where if you get GNS3 and you actually get the router the the router iOSs, um, it everything actually works correctly like it would in a real network. Um, the problem is getting all those different iOS files. And you can see now like the, the address works up. Da, da, da. So that's about it for that lab. So again, if you have any questions or something, make sure you uh, leave a note in the comments. And also don't forget to buy me a beer on Patreon. All right, have a good one, folks.